418 Radio. The Talk with Luke 418 Radio host. Dial area code 602-753-1950. Press 1 to listen live to Luke 418 Radio from your cell phone. Dial area code 602-753-1950. From coast to coast and worldwide on the internet via satellite. This is Luke 418 Radio Network. You guys, 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 radio talk show, the leading cutting edge of Christian radio, exposing the works of darkness and declaring a life of righteousness. Your host, Pastor Bill and Valerie French. Welcome, folks, to the Luke 418 Radio Talk Show, the leading cutting edge of Christian radio. Today we have with us Pastor Bill French Sr., the family study in the Bible. Pastor Bill French, would you go ahead and open up with a word of prayer? Yes, thank you. As as every person, no matter where you are, what you're doing, you can bow your mind and your heart and your soul to God, or you can open your mind and say, Lord, I don't know what this man's going to say, but I ask you today to teach me from your word. And Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit will work now in the lives of every person. Bless your word, open it up, make it understandable, and then, oh Lord, teach them how to apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bill, the mic is yours. Okay, thank you. Today we have the opportunity, and I, and I say that with sincerity, there are many uh, countries right now, even and there's many areas even here in the United States where uh, the Word of God is being hindered from being uh, absorbed by people. Uh, some of it is by... Uh, misleading, some of it is uh, deception, Uh, some of it is uh, saying, now this is what it says, but it doesn't mean that, and they'll go into why it doesn't mean that, and what does it mean, and they'll take you out of the Word of God and give you clarity of man, and man's doctrines, and man's religion, and so on, and so on, and we'll stop that part of it there. We're going to be getting into the chapter 6. And we're, we're going to go through chapter 6, 7, and 8. Not today, but j- just so you, you'll understand, when we get into these, you want to, God has made one thing so clear as you read these. Chapter 6 deals with deliverance from the penalty of sin. Now, you want to remember that. And chapter 7 is going to d- deal with the deliverance from the law. And chapter 8 is going to... D- the be delivering uh, showing you the deliverance from the flesh so one is the the penalty of sin and one is the law and when one is the flesh and you want to see them in the right order as we go through them but you have to study the word of god i truly uh, ask you not to take what i say and just rely upon it or what if I made the, the wrong choice of a word or the definition of a word? Then you would be misled. And can Satan do that? Oh, yes, he can. He can change our hearing to words that sound similar and even fit into the conversation or into the study itself and or take us and mislead us. It's, it's like going down a pathway and you see something and so you say, well, I'm just going to go off here and look at this. And you go down that pathway and you look over and see, well, well, this is going to bring me back to the regular path where I was. But in reality, it never does. It misleads you and brings you into territory that's unfamiliar and will create problems. And so today, as we get into Chapter 6, we have a question. But before this, we want to look at something. We have two aspects of sin. Now, we're just using a word. The first one is the forgiveness of our sins. The second one is the the deliverance from our sin. As I told you before, chapter 6 is deliverance from the penalty of sin. 
and chapter 7 is the deliverance from the law and chapter 8 is the deliverance from the flesh so as we come across these you'll start to see how they apply to your life and it is the one following the other that we can see the uh, practicality of what God is teaching us the reality of what God is teaching us and we want to base this back again on the part that we just came out of chapter 4 and 5 because the first part in chapter 4 and 5 deals with the blood the blood of Christ now the blood of Christ does one thing it delivers us from sin the cross which is the second part it delivers us from the law and it delivers us from the flesh as you read these and you should go back and read them again and again and again until they become fixed in your mind and you see the picture that God has there then each point as we come to it you'll understand how this fits in with what has been said and what has been written so you want to as an individual prepare your own heart you want to seek out the Word of God you want to say yes I understand and we'll get into this in a moment because right in the chapter 6 the first part it says there's a question it says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin and they ask this question that uh, grace may abound now some people say well, what do you mean by this okay it's it's not a simple thing but maybe I just might give a, a kind of an open door that you might go through and find out what it's talking about grace is something that God has given to us we cannot buy it we cannot earn it we can't do a thing for it it's a gift now if God by his grace has forgiven us of sins and we glorify God because what he's forgiven us of people are saying now shall we continue in sin for a purpose that grace may abound that is God's grace may be, be abound it might grow and grow in our lives and as it does we constantly are saying thank you Lord thank you Lord and praise the Lord for his grace and what was the answer in the second verse God forbid here is the key you want to see how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein now death is something and just recently I'm very familiar with understand what the, the word death means it is total separation it's not part separation it's not three-quarters separation it's not 99 percent separation it is total 100 percent separation only God can bring back that which is dead and bring it back to life man has tried all kinds of things God has used men to bring back a person to life but it is God who does the work the man is just the instrument that God is using so it brings us into our third verse and this is the key verse and you want to see this as as we go along it says first thing know this or know you not now if information is there and you refuse to follow it whose fault is it so the first part of it says know this or know you not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ we're baptized into his death now the word baptism if you want to go and look at it in an unabridged dictionary you'll find it means to be put in to be placed in some of you have seen people being baptized in water and what do they do they place you in the water and then submerge you into the water and the water rep represents the death of the individual the death that they have died with Christ Jesus by faith when Christ died every believer in Christ died with him the moment that this is just uh, justified in your mind and you see this God brings you up out of the and we're looking at water for just a moment and we come back to what to life but we are a brand new person and here is where problems lie man says well this is my old habits 
I was a drunkard. I was an alcoholic. I was a sex fiend. I was a thief. I was a, and he goes down the line and lists all these negatives of what he was. And so he says, okay, I don't want to be this anymore, and I don't want to be this anymore, and so I'm going to work at this, and I'm going to change clothes, and I'm going to shave, and I'm going to get a haircut, and I'm going to take myself a shower or a bath, and I'm just going to be a brand new person. Oh, well, and yes, I'm going to shine my shoes, make it look sparkling. This is man trying to, somewhere or another, fit back into society as a person who has been changed. But Matt, that's man doing it. God goes and takes that man, that person, and he says, I planted you with my son, and thereby you died. Now, once you go back with me just a minute to the fifth chapter, if you have your Bibles, and look at the, uh, start with the, okay, verse 19. It says, for by one man's, one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, many be made righteous, or shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered. Now, the law was for a purpose. That the offense might be might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, that's the first part, even so might great grace reign that is a uh, rule, that's what the word reign means, to rule like a king over a, a nation, to reign through re- righteousness. Now, where did the righteousness come from? What did you have to do to get righteousness? God says the righteousness of Jesus Christ is what he supplants upon you. Now, how do we do this? He says he puts us into Christ Jesus. Now, the second we p- we're put into something, we take on what the appearance of what we're put into. We take on the nature of that which we've been placed into. So we have a brand new nature. The the sin nature now has been put to death. And the brand new nature is the nature of Christ Jesus. And it is that righteousness that gets us to where the Father is. Not any righteousness that we have or that we try to create or if we try to be religious and uh, um, put forth the best that man can do. God says in these words, he says, for all has sinned and come short of his glory. That means nobody can, on their own, come to where God is. No man can um, be as God or be like God. Satan wants to. He, he's tried it several times to to rule. He's right this minute, as the scripture says. He is the God of this world. He wants to rule. And yet he cannot be what God is. He, he's powerful. He's, uh, one of the, he is the master deceiver. Uh, his deceptions uh, take people and uh, put them in a category that they don't realize is happening because he is perfect at what he does. He deceives. He is the master of sin. He can never change there's a day that God's going to deal with him personally. And that day there, there will be no uh, um, salvation for that man, no, no time to be justified, uh, no time to change, no time to, uh, and I use the word man, which would be incorrect. Uh, he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. But he uses man to uh, bring forth what he wants done. Well, okay. God says that man that was following and walking in the steps of Satan, being led by him because Satan reigned over him, he says, now God makes him a brand new person. How does he do this? By death. That man dies. He died in Christ Jesus. The moment that Christ Jesus died and was crucified, by faith, every person who puts their faith in Christ Jesus and receives him as their Lord and Savior, their Redeemer, the one who has paid the, sin, the, the penalty for their sin, at that particular moment, God makes them a brand new person. As the scripture says, now we become the sons of God. We don't know what it's like. We're learning how the Spirit of God now incorporates itself, himself in, in us, and now starts to lead us in the way that God the Father wants us to go. And he does this all through Jesus Christ. 
Christ Jesus is our righteousness. So as we're placed in Christ, God sees the righteousness of the Son, and we, at that particular moment, become righteous in the eyes of the Lord. And that's when he has baptized us into, into death. And we're going to the fourth verse. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If you're a new person in Christ Jesus, you'll have a different walk. You'll have a different talk. You'll have different actions. Your eyes will behold things different. It will not be focused upon the things that this world offers to you. When you see them, you realize that these are the things of the world, and Satan is the one who's in control of them, and you don't want to be controlled by him, so you have yielded yourself to the Father, and now he does the changing. He makes us a brand new person. The old, what happened to it? It died. It's buried. It's buried. It's gone. Now, we're like a brand new baby. We should desire the sincere milk of the Word. We should go to the Word of God daily, many times during the day. Take it with you wherever you go. Wherever you have the opportunity to stand or sit down, uh, wherever it might be, and read the Word of God, read it. It doesn't matter how much of it you read, it's, read it. It's food for your soul now. You are a new person. You need to be fed, just like a baby. You need to be fed. And that's where he uses it. And the illustration, the, the milk of the word. And as you start to get yourself uh, drinking of this milk of the word, then he starts to give you some uh, pieces of bread to chew on because you're brand new and you don't have, yet have all the capacity to digest all that's there. So he gives you pieces. And as you get these pieces, you, they taste so good. And they're so wonderful, you want more and more and more. And pretty soon, he tells you, now, I want you to chew on the meat of the Word. I want you to spend some time in the Word of God. I want you to grow. If you don't eat, you won't grow. So what I want you to do is to eat. I want you to grow. Going back to verse 5 now. It says, For if we had been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. When he planted us in Christ Jesus, we died. Now, because of Jesus Christ is resurrected, we are now taken on that resurrection person, that new person. In verse 6 now, he comes back to our key word again. Knowing this, that is, you're not guessing at something. You're not hoping for something. You're not saying, well, someone told me. No, it's you're knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Christ Jesus. That is, he died with Christ Jesus. For what purpose? That the body of sin, now that's this house that we live in, this thing we call a human body, that this body of sin might be destroyed. Now, we have a, a word, and the word destroy here means to render idle. Um, if you're in a car, and uh, there's a long line up of cars stand, coming, that you're coming to, uh, do you just keep your uh, uh, foot to the place that uh, you can just step into the gas at any moment, or do you take it out of gear? As they say, if you take it out of gear, you only use a little bit of gasoline because you're not turning your transmission over. But So the, the car is what? It's idling. It's just sitting, sitting there and idling. It becomes inactive. It's not moving. It's not going forward, not going backwards, and you hope the wind is not blowing it sideways. It has become like a car that has just been inoperative. Because why? You have it out of gear. And the gears of the car, powered by the power of the motor, make the car to move. So the car ceases to do what it was doing that was going forward. It just sits because that's what the traffic is doing. So if we can see this in our life, God says you're no longer going forward in the things of this flesh. You're ceasing from them, and God's going to enable you to be a different person. He, he, he's getting on to you um, 
the filling of his word, which satisfies your soul and your, and, and your spirit, which imparts strength to you, and you're starting to grow. Then we come to the rest of this particular verse, which is care, uh, care, carefully said. Again, going back to knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Why? That henceforth we should not do what? We should not serve sin. You see, you've been a servant of sin. You've been under that um, official uh, king, Satan, and now God has freed you from him, and you're no longer standing there waiting to uh, do what he wants you to do. You no longer serve sin. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. So many people think, well, you know, I'll, I'll never stop sinning. Well, what did this word just say to you? Look at verse 7 again. For he that is what dead is freed from sin. My, my wife just passed away last month. And in the process, she is freed from all the diseases, the heat, uh, the cold, uh, the sicknesses, um, the laws of this land. She's freed from all these things. If you were able to go where she is and get to, to that coffin where she's been, her body's been buried, not she, but her coffin's been, uh, her, her body's been buried in this coffin, you would just see a figure, the house she lived in, but she's no longer there. She's gone home. The Lord has called her, and she's going to meet with him. And he is going to bless her in ways that you and I don't comprehend. But one day, every person who believes in Christ will see him as he is, and will praise him and glorify him, and we will rejoice in his presence, and we'll have joy that's unspeakable. We won't know how to handle it. We will just be elite in a, a, looking at him uh, just being blessed over and over and over and over again, realizing what he has done. I'm going to stop here for a moment just to give you a short picture. Christ Jesus, who was entirely sinless, no sin whatsoever, no thought of sin whatsoever, had never committed a sin whatsoever, has now said to us, when you're with me, you are sinless. There's no penalty. You're going to just rejoice in me, and I'm going to rejoice in you, and you're free. Verse 8 says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also what? Live with him. So you see, it's not death and separation. It is now death that has separated us from this body of ours, this old man, and now has placed us in the Christ Jesus, and now we're alive in him. Again, we come back to that little wonderful word, nine, verse nine, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, he does not die anymore. Now, stop and think of that for a moment. He died, he rose, and death has no more dominion over him. Now, do you remember in the scripture as you've read the wage of sin is what? Death. Now, he's already paid that penalty, so death can never, ever punish his body again. Every person who believes in Christ Jesus has been freed from death. Now, remember, death is separation. You've been freed from the one who has held you in bondage, and now you're free in Christ Jesus and you have access to the very throne of God, the Father. You are a brand new person. Nine again. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Verse 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin. What? How many times? Once it says. That's right. Just once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So that the life has changed. When we die, we no longer will serve sin. We'll no longer serve the master of sin. 
will no longer serve the one who controls death right this moment. We will be alive in Christ Jesus, and we will serve the Father. We live unto him. Verse 11 says, likewise reckon. Now, if he lives unto God, it says, likewise reckon. Now, the word reckon means to count. Count the soul. Ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto, excuse me, unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Now, remember again. Death is what? It's separation. So at this particular moment, every person who has placed himself alive in Christ Jesus, they are dead to sin. Sin has no more rule over them. Cannot tell them what to do. Cannot entice them. Oh, sin wants to uh, draw you in and make something so pretty that you just say, oh, i got to see what this is. Ooh, I've got to taste that. Ooh, i got to try that. You see, that's, that's the, the master deceiver. But God says he's made us free, and we're now living unto him. So we, we count this soul when he says we reckon this soul in your life. You count it so that you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12. The key to what you want to understand and put to practice every day. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Now stop right there for a moment. What does it tell us? Do not let sin, it doesn't matter what kind of sin it is, sin of thought, word, or deed. Do not let it rule in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust there. The word lust means desire, that you desire to do or participate or to have or whatever that case might be. So you're no longer desiring these things. Why? Because you have a new nature. And that new nature is the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, did he desire to go out and involve himself in the sins of this world? No. He despised the sins of this world. And in his mercy and grace, he paid the penalty that the sins of this world cast upon you. And that is death. He paid for it. So back to 12 again. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it in the lust thereof or the desire. 13. Neither, and now this is where some people have a problem. Neither yield ye your members. Excuse me. As, instru- as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, think of your body for a moment. You have hands, you have feet, you have eyes, you have tongue. You have a variety of different portions of your body. He says, God is saying, don't yield any of these things unto sin. doesn't matter what it is or what kind of sin it is. Don't yield yourself to it. Now, there's all kinds of fleshly sins, and God says, don't get yourself involved. There's all kinds of mental sins, and God says, don't get yourself involved. Don't yield your mind unto them. Yield your mind unto me. He says, says, as those that are alive from the dead, that's how we're to do it. Are you alive from the dead? Have you been uh, crucified with Jesus Christ? You believe that you died with him, that you've been buried with him, and that you've been resurrected with him. That's you, the person. You say, but look at my my body here, Lenny. No, that's, that's the house you live in. You are a person who lives in that house. And it's that person who has died and has been buried and now has been resurrected. And then it says, now these members of yours, they are instruments of righteousness unto God. So when you use them for unrighteousness, now God says, use them for righteousness. Verse 14. Can you believe this? Now I want you to listen to this verse. For sin shall not. Let me repeat that part again. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace is God's gift of love. And at that particular time when you receive it, God says, sin shall not have dominion over you, shall not be in charge of you, shall not tell you what to do, shall not entice you, shall not lead you down that path, whatever it might be. 
15. What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law. That takes us back to our first portion of the scripture where we read. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? But here it says, No, you're not. That to whom you, you yourself servants who obey, his servant are to whom you obey. Whether a sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now stop here just a moment. Look at your body. Look at yourself today. Have you yielded yourself today to the things of this world in the sense that you have denied what God told you to do, rejected it, and you walked in your own way? Is that what you've done? Well, God's Word tells us that if you have sinned, He wants you to confess that sin to Him. That is, tell Him what you did. Lift Him what you did. It says, and then He is faithful, and He is just to forgive you of all those sins, and then not only to forgive you, but to cleanse you so that you know you're free, clean, standing in the presence of God Almighty, your Father, in Christ Jesus is the means of redemption. In Christ Jesus is life eternal. While you're in Christ Jesus, you see, you cannot, God will not allow you to walk in sin. He will chastise you the moment you start or he will allow whatever sin that you want to get yourself involved in to be a means of chastising like and chastising is like turning you over somebody's knee and laying the rod of correction on that little spot on the back of your seat and let you have the punishment of correction but God says you shall not then he comes again Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. 16, no, you're not. We come back to our key word again. That to whom you yield yourself servants to obey. Now listen to that. To whom you yield, you do the yielding. His servant you are to whom you obey. So Satan says, I want you to do this, and this, and this, and this, and it sounds real good. It's very enticing. And uh, really, you don't see anything wrong with it. And no one's getting hurt, you believe. And so you yield yourself as a servant. A servant is one who is uh, in bondage to the master. And God says you're no longer in bondage to sin. So now you're, you, uh, you're now to serve the one to whom you obey. Are you being obedient to God the Father through Jesus Christ the Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are you just being obedient to self and uh, walking in the things in the way of this world? What is your answer to that? You see, only, only you can answer that to yourself. No, only that. And that's when that verse starts out with, no, you not. Do you not know this? So when you find out what it is that you know and should know, then you're going to find out, are you walking in sin unto death or as obedience unto righteousness? Verse 17, but God be thanked and love this, that you were, that's past tense, the servants of sin. But you are, that's present tense, have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Again, here come back to our word of deliverance. 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now, you today are choosing whether you want to be a servant of sin or a servant of unto righteousness. Yes, you are choosing that today. And you're choosing that by the things you see, the things you hear, the things you say, your active and or inactive way of receiving or giving. <clears throat> you choose. So you can't blame someone else. You can't say, well, if it hadn't been for her or if it hadn't been for him or if it hadn't been for them, I wouldn't have done this. No, you do the choosing. You say, but I would have been hurt. Well, what is the best, to be hurt and walk in the way of the Lord or not be hurt and walk in the way of Satan and out of fellowship and contrary to God's will? God says the wage of sin is death and death is separation. 
So when you start to walk in sin, whatever kind it is, you're separating yourself from God Almighty, the Father, because of what you've chosen to do. Is it hard? Oh, yes. Uh, I, without any illustrations, I know it very, very full. Uh, realize what God said one time to me. You choose today. And I said, Lord, I choose you. Could I have had things of this world system? Yes, I could. But God said no, and I chose to walk with the Lord, and he's taken care of me ever since. Even in this time when I'm missing my wife, <coughs> the joy of the Lord fills my heart. Does loneliness come in for my wife? Well, yes, it does. Do I miss her in that sense? Yes. Uh, every night I miss my wife. But he's filling my heart with, him, with his presence. And he's allowing me to go into a sleep that relaxes my body, my mind, and my soul. And I know that he supplies over and above even what I think I should have or expect to have. Because he is my deliverer. Yes, he does this. Back, back to 16 and then we'll go on. Know you not that to whom you you yourself servant to obey, your servant to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servant, past tense, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. 18. Being then made free, only a person who understands free can take this portion of Scripture and apply it to the lies. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to, unright, to uncleanness and to, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members uh, to righteousness unto holiness. You see... When you're walking in righteousness, you're having fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you walk in unrighteousness, your own fellowship you're having is with the things of this world, the powers of this world, Satan being your master, telling you what to do, telling you how to do it, showing you what you're going to have, and then enticing you to walk in that way. And God says, if you walk in sin... I have to punish you. If you're my child, I have to turn you over my knee and lay the rod of correction where it needs to be laid so that you can understand. Verse 20, For when you were, past tense again, the servant of sin, you notice there's that separation? You were the servant of sin, but you were, you were free, and you were when you were the servant of sin, and you were free from righteousness. Now the question came, or comes, whichever tense you want to look at. What fruit had you then in those things wherever you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Sin brings death. Jesus Christ brings life. When you have confessed all these things that you were ashamed of, God has washed them away. He's made you into a brand new person. But now, 22, but now being made free from sin and became servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end everlasting life. Now, go, look back at that verse again, fellows and ladies and children. God says you have fruit. Fruit is the evidence of what you are. If you see a beautiful, if you have one, or you know what I'm talking about, a beautiful peach tree, and the fruit is hanging on the tree, and you go by, and you smell this beautiful aroma come down, and you take one off, and you start to uh, chew upon that, that fruit, and it's nice and ripe. You say, oh, this is delicious. I can't think of anything better to have. I am just pleased and thanking God for what he's given to me. And you're rejoicing in that fruit. But now it says you're made free from sin, and 22 again, and you're being free from sin and become the servant of God. You have your fruit unto holiness 
And God says, you are. There's another portion in God's word, and, uh, word it's in uh, uh, First John, and it talks about that God is holy, and he makes you holy. You, you see, what he is, he makes you to be. Yeah, that's right. He makes you to be. So if you want to a holy God, then you have to be holy. And God says, I'll make you holy. And here he's telling us that you have fruit unto holiness in the end, everlasting life. Now back to 23, the last verse in this chapter. For the wage of sin is what again? Separation, death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now stop right there just for a moment. You, did you notice two things? To get death, you have to work for it, and you earn it by walking in sin. But life is a gift. It's a gift that God gives, and this life is eternal. And this life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. You cannot have this life without Jesus Christ. He is the means of eternal life. He will bless you in a way that I cannot describe to you, and you can only experience it as you yield yourself. Today, are you willing to look at what sin is? Sin is that which brings death. That in order death is, is, is the evidence of it. Are you willing to give this to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you going to take up what God says and he wants to make you righteous? He wants to reconcile you to himself. So there's nothing between you and God at all. You're, you're rejoicing in that presence, in that fellowship, in that relationship that only God can give to you. God says he makes you a person that has been changed. And the change starts from the inside. Man starts from the outside. Using our old expression again, you go out and get yourself a haircut, a shave if you're a man. Uh, you get new shoes and, and a suit or, or clothing like onto a suit that's new, clean. And the same thing for the underwear underneath you. And you've taken a shower and you've brushed your teeth and you've cleaned your fingernails and, and you put a smile on your face. You've maybe gone to the dentist and he's done some work on it so your smile was beautiful. And you look in the mirror and you're just so pleased with what you have done. You know what I said? You have done. But you're still the same person. You're just a different picture in the eyes of the beholder. That's all. It's that person who's inside of you that has to be transformed, changed, reconciled to God. And that only comes when God forgives the sins and washes you clean. As he says in First John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just. And he will forgive us our sins and the cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants to do a work in your life. Do you want to do that work? Are you willing to let him do that work? Are you, are you willing to say today, Lord, I want you to transform me? Um, if we could just l look at something for just a moment here. Sin itself is a lie. Yeah, sin is a lie. That, that's a new sin because it, it lies to you. It tells you how something's going to be. And when you get to that place, you find out that's not so. And then second, sin is a delusion. That's taking the mind and changing the mind, and you don't see what is there. Third, sin is darkness. There is no light where sin is. You ever notice people who want to commit crimes, they, they do it where darkness is, uh, a shade, uh, away from people, um, in a valley, uh, in a park, um, down by the riverbed, uh, along the seashore where people aren't at night, um, where buildings have been closed down and they break into them. It's what? Darkness. They don't go down there and turn on the floodlights so everybody can see what they're doing. They want darkness 
to hide what they are doing. Sin is separation. When sin is through uh, separating us from God, and we have rejected God's gift, then God says we will be cast into the lake of fire. And I won't, I won't get into that, but that's the ultimate goal. That's the, the payment for your sin. You see, sin will give you a payment. And sin is a perversion. Yeah, it's sin not, not only is a perversion, but it also uh, chooses to loosen the thinking power of your mind. It loads you up with all kinds of things of loose living. And sin is servitude. You either serve God or you serve sin. You say, well, I'm, a slave. I'm not a slave to anybody. Oh, yes, you are. You're a slave to yourself, trying to please your physical body in whatever area that it might be. Or you have submitted yourself to God and you serve him. And God blesses you in ways you will not comprehend. You will see them. You will experience them. And you'll understand that God is doing this, not self and not other people. Oh, God might use other people to help bless you for whatever way that that might come about. But you still are the servant of that sin nature. You will serve uh, Satan in that capacity. And all he wants to do is blind you because he wants to keep you from what God has offered. He wants to bring you to the place that you are pleased with the sin that you're walking in. But God says, I loved you and I loved you so much that I gave my son to die for you, to pay for your sins. Today, as you listen, if you have not, can you go to the Lord right now and say, Lord, you know, you know me. You see all the actions that I've committed. You watch the things, Father, that my eyes have looked upon, that my heart has desired, the things that seem to please just me, the, the flesh person. So today I, I ask you first to realize as I share these things that I know I'm a sinner and I confess each one of these sins that I know that I have committed to you for the purpose that you might not only forgive me but you might cleanse me cleanse completely so there's no stain no shadow of turning nothing at all I am purified made holy in the very presence of God God has washed away all sin I'm a brand new person today can you do that and if you've done that can you give him thanks for what you already have done can you thank him for his mercy for his grace for his love what he had done he's taking you out of the darkness and he's put you into the light. Sin blinds you. Sin deceives you. Sin defiles you. Sin destroys you. But in Jesus Christ, you are made a brand new person. Can you come to him today? And will you come to him today? And say, Lord, here's what I see. Here's what I know. And I believe that Jesus died for my sins. He's paid my penalty. And today, I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. You are my God, my Redeemer. And I thank you for paying for my sin for me and cleansing me from all unrighteousness. And today, I yield myself unto you. I no longer conform to this world, but I'm transformed. I'm a brand new person, and I'm praising the Lord for you. I'm praising the Lord because you have done this, and you've done it because you love me. Was I worthy? No, very unworthy. But because you love me, 
I am now free. And I shall be free. As the scripture says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that freedom is everlasting freedom. Will you today receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? In the first chapter of the book of the Gospel of John, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Can you believe that? Will you accept that? Will you bow your heart and your head or maybe your body in whatever way you can today and say, Lord, here I am and I realize what you have done for me and how much you love me and I give myself to you. And to my brothers and sisters out there who already know you, I'm asking you this. As Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Will you do that? Will you set before him today and say, Lord, I want to learn. I want to learn, and then I want to learn to apply it to my life. Give unto me the hunger and the thirst for your word. And give me nothing but your word so I can honor you and praise you and glorify you by what you have written and I now have allowed to take place in my life, will you do that for me? No. Will you trust the Lord to do that in your life? I'm going to turn you back over to my son he, that he might share something with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, this has been a real in-depth five-star study of Romans chapter 6. You know, what i like for everyone to do is to make sure this week that you reckon yourself to be indeed dead to sin. No longer allowing sin to be a part of you. But every day to remember that you are alive in God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This way, as God says, you be holy and I'm holy. So, as God is holy, God wants you to walk just like him. Have the mind of Christ to walk in holiness and righteousness. Pastor Bill French, it's such an honor and a privilege to have you back on the show of the Luke 418 radio talk show to bring the teaching of God's word. This is powerful teaching. And every believer needs to apply these instructions to their lives. Well, folks, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today and being a part of us. We look forward to see you online tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific Time. And at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on the Luke 418 Radio Talk Show. We'll see you then. The Righteous Twins will be on. It's going to be a power-packed show, so I encourage you to join. God bless you. Bye now. God bless you. Bye-bye. Do you sometimes feel that you just can't control your thoughts? Do you feel hounded by bad memories of the past that still feel alive today? Are you hurting on the inside? If so, Luke 418 Counseling Center can help free you from the pursuit of that mental and spiritual anguish. Pastor Bill French has spent a lifetime helping the tormented and healing the wounded. Free yourself from the past and free yourself from the hurt you're feeling today. If you are experiencing repeated feelings of anger, hatred, lack of self-control, anxiety, or confusion, call the Freedom Doctor, Pastor Bill French, today to set up a consultation. 951-402-8530. Pastor Bill French at the Luke 418 Counseling Center is a specialized Christian-based counselor. Call us today, 951-402-8530. Luke 418 Radio has been commissioned in these last days to preach Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the only name written under heaven by which men might be saved. Our mission is to teach and train up the body of Christ in the Great Commission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ 
to cast out evil spirits. Pray over the sick that they may be healed. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. If this program is a blessing to you and you would like to take part in this end-time harvest of souls, join us by donating online. Go to www.luke418radio.com. God bless you.